19.4% and obese of 19%. That's the England figures from the National Child Measurement Programme. Uh, the figures for Wigan from that same bit of research actually shows they're actually on par with, with, the, with the England data in general. So obviously there, there is some work that needs to be done there to actually try and um, increase the health, uh, health chances of these children. So what did we do? Um, we had five control schools and six intervention schools. You can see the numbers of the children there. We took um, an already established um, publication um, teaching programme for the United States called Planet Health and Eat Well and Keep Moving. We anglicised this for our children because of course some of the foods, for example, some of their dietary um, references uh, are very different in the United States. So we obviously needed to make it um, in line with legislation in this country uh, and obviously make sure there were foods in, in our teaching programme here which the children were familiar with. Um, some of the um, some of the chapters within that, that 20 week intervention programme we were looking at trying to keep um, how the children could measure energy balance, um, being carb smart, so choosing perhaps those foods that were more whole grain as opposed to those that contained an awful lot of sugar, uh, making good beverage choices, that sort of thing. So the background to this is that um, when we started to look at food knowledge, there's actually the evidence is really unclear about if you actually try and increase food knowledge in children, it doesn't necessarily lead to this improvement in dietary intakes that we're looking for. Um, one particular author, Annie Anderson, who's well known in this field, has suggested that there's a, there's a lack of appropriate tools to do that. So it's very difficult to try and measure some of the, these changes and these links between food knowledge and, and dietary intakes. We also looked at the indices of multi de multiple de deprivation for these children. Um, I'll come on to it in a second, uh, how, how we did that. Um, and we use these scores to actually measure deprivation. So don't confuse deprivation with poverty, it's actually a different thing. Um, this particular method uses seven standardised domains, so it would look at housing, disability, um, income, the living environment, those sorts of things, to actually get a measure from particular postcodes of the, the level of deprivation within those areas. When we started to look at indices of multiple deprivation and levels of overweightness, um, there's very mixed evidence out there um, linked with both obesity and overweight. Um, but again, there is quite a, there is quite a, a lot of uh, evidence there. However, when it comes to looking at food knowledge, so what do these children actually know about the food that they're eating and how that links in with their particular IND scores? Um, there was very, very, well, I couldn't find any, any information out there um, to, to compare my data with. So what did I try to do? What I did is I took all the children we had all the postcodes, and we divided them up into quartiles. So if the children had a particular score that was created from those seven domains, they actually went into IMD 1, 2, 3, and 4. Those in IMD 1 were in areas of lower deprivation, so that those sort of more wealthier areas. And the children at the opposite end of the scale, IMD 4, were in areas of high deprivation, so obviously uh, those lower socioeconomic areas. They filled in a questionnaire. We had these food knowledge scores. And then just to see, we looked at the scores for each of those different IMDs, but also because we were, had an intervention in there as well, the teaching programme, we actually had to split them up as well to see if there had been any impact there uh, with the intervention children. So the food questionnaire I used to actually collect um, their, their levels of, of food knowledge was one called Cooking Kids by Anderson and Annie Anderson that I mentioned earlier. Um, the reason we chose this questionnaire was um, the children could self-report their responses, so they basically had to just tick boxes on a, on a questionnaire. Because of the numbers of children we were dealing with, we, we needed um, a questionnaire that was like that. It asked children if they had the knowledge of particular ingredients to make particular foods, did they know how long foods could be cooked for, um, how did they self-assess their ability to make certain foods, and then obviously a general knowledge uh, quiz about nutrition. There was a wrong and a right answer there, basically. And there was a total score of 59 that was possible. That's just an example of one of the pages of the nutrition. So, for example, how many portions of fruit and veg are recommended by health experts to be eaten every day? So they would tick the answer. That, and I hope everybody in this room would be able to answer that one. And then there's just an example of a page. <coughs> so at the top there, question four, the four main ingredients needed to make up a crumble. Um, so there's some foods on there that obviously the children would be very, very familiar with and here's your self-assessability section there. 
So that was, the, that was the food knowledge side of things. So actually, how did we then calculate the IMD scores? Well, we collected the postcodes of all the children that were taking part, put them into a program called GeoConvert. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. It basically converts um, those postcodes into IMD scores. Um, a lot of complicated mathematics goes on, so I'm not even going to go near that. But it's freely available if, if you wanted to do that kind of work. And then, as I said earlier, we divide them up into quartiles, with one being the least deprived and four the most. So, what did we find? Well, when we looked at the IMD scores overall for change, then we had a huge range there from six, which is obviously the areas of lower deprivation, through to 66, higher deprivation. So, a, a very wide range. So, you could argue that we were covering most um, levels of deprivation uh, within the area we were looking yeah. in. Uh, the scores for change, the mean one was 27.85, which is actually just slightly better than the Wigan mean of, twen of 26. When we looked at um, uh, the percentages of, um, of participants in the particular quartiles, if you look here, the, sort of the middle two quartiles are actually fairly evenly balanced. But if you look at those for the areas of higher, uh, sorry, lower deprivation and higher deprivation, we do have this imbalance in the number of participants. So for those in the areas of, higher, uh, of lower deprivation, uh, we have a higher proportion, obviously, of intervention children. And those in the areas of lower deprivation, we have a higher proportion of control children. And as we see later, th this might be an impact of why we've got some of the results that we've got with the food knowledge. So... Overall, there's no significant differences between the control or intervention children in their food knowledge, um, either at baseline or at post-intervention. Um, however, we did find some significant differences between the third quartile and the fourth quartile at baseline, where those children from the areas of low deprivation actually scored higher than the children from low... Uh, high, the children from lower deprivation actually scored higher than the children from... Um, Children from lower deprivation scored higher than those children from higher deprivation. Uh, the graph probably explained it better than me, <laughs> me talking it. So if you look at the, the numbers in red here, for these particular, what we're particularly looking at here, as you can see at baseline, the children in the areas of lower deprivation scored significantly higher, so almost four marks really, um, higher than the children from the areas of higher deprivation. So um, that, that's quite interesting. Equally, we've had significant differences between baseline and post-intervention for the children in, in, in second quartile. Again, there was this increase in score can be seen. So if you look at this column here for the children from the second quartile, again, excellent, increased their scores by about three marks. Same again, the children from um, the areas of uh, lower deprivation, higher deprivation, um, again, there was a, an increase in score. Uh, again, around about sort of uh, four marks. So there were some increases there um, between the baseline and the post-intervention. So what can we conclude from these results? Um, it's quite difficult to sort of make any, any definite conclusions. What we do know is that all those quartiles did increase their mean scores. So we could look at that as a positive. The children didn't get the... Um, the right or the wrong answers given to them in between those two data points. So they approached each, uh, each data, every time the data was collected at baseline or post-intervention, they didn't know what the right or the wrong um, answers were, uh, to be honest. So, so that, that increase in scores it could, could be real. Um, the fourth quartile, so those are our children in higher deprivation, displayed the greatest increase in marks. Like I said, almost sort of four marks there, which is, which is, which is really good. And the children in the first quartile, those areas of, of lower deprivation, displayed the least increase, but it was, it was still an increase. So, why is there this increase in those, in those scores for the children from the areas of high deprivation? Um, there certainly was, when we did some statistical analysis, there certainly was some effect at post-intervention of the baseline um, uh, uh, exposure at, at baseline. So, we know that from a statistical point of view. Potentially, there was some influence of the teaching intervention. So if you remember that graph from at the, at the beginning where there was a high proportion of intervention children in the areas of, of high deprivation, then potentially, by having the teaching intervention, um, there has been some effect there on those children. 
However, the other argument there is that those children from the, from the fourth quartile actually had, uh, had a greater uh, potential for improvement in their scores. They sort of had, had, had bigger, a bigger way to go, so therefore the effect would be, would be, would be seen more. So uh, without further investigation, it's, it's difficult to, to conclude that. Um, and obviously, the children in the, the first quartile in the areas of lower deprivation, um, is this exposure thing, potentially their families, um, um, you know, the environment they live in, the families that they're from, um, means they would automatically um, have, have those higher scores anyway because of the environment they're living in. Um, so more work would need to be done with that and a better tool obviously would perhaps make, make some of those results a little bit clearer. Um, but it's, this, it's quite a good starting point for me to actually then start looking at the tools that are being used for, for gathering food knowledge data from these children. So I'd like to thank Wigan Council for all their help with all this and we couldn't have done it obviously without the staff, the children and the parents. They were all absolutely loved me here in the schools and I would do it all over again if given half a chance. So, uh, and obviously Dr. Alan Hackett helped me out quite a lot as well. Thank you very much.